Good morning. Welcome to the fifth panel of this conference, which will be devoted to the international law and its practical relevance. Uh, although we have uh, three eminent scholars, international lawyers, and one uh, senior policy advisor, it will be not an uh, academic discussion. It will be a practical session, and I will encourage you to raise questions. I will also try to, to limit uh, Introduction, uh, introductory remarks to six minutes, and I, will, uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to discuss uh, uh, several points which uh, politicians, journalists, uh, lawyers uh, are asking. What are legal possibilities to bring people uh, guilty of crimes of aggression, crimes against peace, war crimes, or crimes against humi humanity, perhaps even genocide, to justice? What are, what are risks and challenges associated with that? Then would it be advisable to set up a, a, a new court, a new tribunal to deal with crimes committed in Ukraine? Or it would be uh, sufficient to, uh, to use existing instrument like uh, International Criminal Court? Then what political support actually does the war crimes investigation and trials of the uh, perpetrators require? What are possibilities for international cooperation and uh, in investigation and trials of war crimes perpetrators? And last but not least, what are legisl uh, legislative solutions and ideas to use Russian states and Russian oligarchs funds to pay for war crimes damages? And those questions uh, I will uh, address to our panelists. Uh, so please uh, respond uh, within six minutes, and uh, uh, we'll organize a discussion in following order. Professor Richter, Professor Grzebek, Professor Melzo, and uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Masalo. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Which way is preferable to punish war crimes, national or international courts, or both? War crimes can be prosecuted in national courts, provided that there is a sufficient link between the crime and the state prosecuting. They can also be dealt with by international courts, provided that they have jurisdiction. Neither Ukraine nor Russia nor Belarus is party to the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, ICC. But Ukraine, by two declarations, has recognized uh, the jurisdiction of the ICC for, I quote, acts committed in the territory of Ukraine since the 21st of October 2013. Additionally, 43 states parties requested the ICC to initiate investigations. Never before has such a number of states done so. These so-called referrals allowed the ICC prosecutor to begin investigations on the, third, the, the 2nd of March with regard to crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide committed by any person on Ukrainian territory or occurring there. In contrast, unfortunately, the ICC has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression because the Rome Statute explicitly limits uh, this to states' parties. Now, can national courts be effective in prosecution? Concerning the situation in Ukraine, many states, such as Poland, have initiated investigations. They are allowed to do so because the principle of universality with respect to crimes under international law permits prosecution even by states that have no link to the relevant crime. Of course, Poland has a certain link. And because of the special character of these crimes, the international law rules of functional immunity do not preclude prosecution of foreign officials, for example, Russian soldiers, by national courts. 
In contrast, Russian, the Russian president, prime minister, and foreign minister enjoy absolute personal immunity while in office, even with regard to crimes under international law. This was confirmed by the International Court of Justice in the arrest warrant case in 2002. Only after um, they leave office, state leaders' personal immunity is transformed into mere functional immunity. And this does not protect them safely from prosecution prosecution for serious crimes that they committed while in office. Can international courts be more effective? Ukraine has recognized ad hoc the jurisdiction of the ICC. But can Russian perpetrators be held responsible, although the Russian Federation has not accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC? Yes, they can because it is irrelevant that the crimes were planned and ordered in Russia as long as their consequences occurred in Ukraine. However, the so-called complementarity principle can um, be an obstacle. Since the ICC may only complement national jurisdiction, national pro uh, proceedings have priority provided that they are effective. But to make a case inadmissible, a national authority must show first that it is actually investigating or has investigated a specific case, and second, that the national case sufficiently mirrors the ICC case. This is the same case test. If the national authority cannot present such a case, or prefers not to present it, ICC proceedings will be admissible. Is the ICC prevented by personal immunity to prosecute the political leaders of the Russian Federation or Belarus? No. According to the Omar al-Bashir judgment of 2019, Personal immunity protects them only from prosecution by national courts of other states, not by international courts. Here lies a significant advantage of international jurisprudence. And my last point, do we have to accept the fact that the ICC cannot prosecute the political and military leaders of the Russian Federation and Belarus of the crime of aggression? Not quite, is my answer. At least there is a chance to prevent impunity by establishing a special tribunal. The General Assembly of, of the United Nations should take the initiative on the basis of the Uniting for Peace resolution and willing state could then establish such a tribunal by international treaty. That's it for the moment. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dagmar. Thank you also for excellent time discipline. I have already several questions, but uh, uh, now I would like to pass the floor to Patricia. Thank you. My name is Patricia Grzebek, so I will <laughs> help you with the pronunciation of my last name. Uh, and I would start from the statement that there is no doubt that um, international crimes are committed on the territory of Ukraine. And, but uh, the classification of those uh, crimes, whether this is crime against humanity or genocide, is not so important at this stage. I assure you that lawyers would deal with this, and they can argue about this for many years. But what is now needed, this is the political will to really decide in which direction we are going. And this is very important. Why? Because we are losing this momentum. I just wanted to remind you that the first uh, General Assembly resolution based on the procedure of Uniting for Peace, which uh, condemned aggression, of, um, um, condemned aggression uh, committed by uh, Russia, was adopted with uh, 141 um, votes. But, for example, the last uh, resolution, which excluded Russia from the Human Rights Council, was adopted just with 93 votes. So so we see that we are losing this political support for other steps uh, taken on universal level against uh, Russia. 
what, because we observed many crimes in media, we could uh, uh, read also uh, reliable report, uh, reports, like for example, made by OECC, which, uh, which admitted that yes, we have war crimes, yes, we have crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine, and we need to deal and we need to attribute this responsibility to particular uh, people. So not only Ukraine, but now world expects peace. And if you want to have durable peace, you cannot ignore the question of the justice. Because history shows that if you do not fulfill this task to attribute the uh, responsibility to individual people, nations will blame the whole nations. We don't want it. We, what we observe now, we observe huge tension in our region between different nations and blaming the whole Russian population. We should avoid it. We should indicate who is responsible for what kind of crimes. And we do not blame the whole nation for, for example, rapes, uh, um, killing uh, of people who are in the hands of the enemy. So that's why this justice is very important. But when we talk about justice, we are not talking only about justice uh, concerning individual criminal responsibility. We are talking about full reparations to pay for all the destruction. And we need to be aware that we do not have unlimited resources to rebuild Ukraine and to invest our money into um, the criminal proceedings. That's why we need to think about the costs of the justice. And establishment of the new tribunal, which uh, mentioned, was mentioned by Professor Dagmar Richter, of course involves the costs. So why, we, maybe we should use the procedures which we no, which we already know. So the support for the ICC is the one thing, but ICC will focus only on a few people. This will not satisfy the needs of the Ukrainian population. But don't forget that this justice should be owed by the Ukraine, Ukrainian nation. That's why maybe the best option would be really support made by the United Nations to the Ukrainian judicial system and establishment of internationalized hybrid tribunal. So you would have international judges which would uh, uh, secure you know, the, the proceedings which will be unbiased, which will be fair, uh, but they will support Ukrainian judicial system to deal with all the crimes which we are uh, talking about. And um, this is um, also very important to remember that Ukrainian criminal code already has uh, the provisions concerning war crimes, provisions concerning crime of aggression. Mm -hmm. And I would argue with Dagmar concerning this question of absolute um, immunity. Yes, this is true. We have this uh, judgment of the International Court of Justice. And of course, lawyers would love to believe that they rule the world. But in fact, the decisions are taken by politicians. What does it mean? International Court of Justice exactly mentioned in its judgment that what the court does, it observes how states behave. So if now states are convinced that even the head of the state should respond for the international crimes, and states would take the decisions that they will start investigation, they will issue arrest warrants, this is the change of the practice. This is the possibility to change customary law concerning the immunities. And this can be made by states now and this cannot be ignored by lawyers in any international court. So please don't forget about this, that the all lies in the hands of, uh, the, of the politicians, not of the lawyers. But lawyers are prepared to serve you and to find solutions to judge all criminals which we are talking about. And why I'm stressing that we should do this together with the United Nations, of course they are... Um, um, they are ideas uh, to involve European Union, Council of Europe, OEC, and so on. But what is important is to show that what we observe in Ukraine, this is not a regional problem. This is the problem of world peace and security. So yes, we have, for example, universal jurisdiction which can be used by national courts. But for example, Poland decided on other option. Poland uh, decided to start the investigation based on the protective jurisdiction. Why? Because Poland wanted to stress that if we talk about responsibility for the crime of aggression, this is the crime which is not just against Ukraine. It is just not just against regional security, so the security of the Baltic state, Ukraine, the neighbor states, yeah? No, this is the crime against the, the whole security system, the whole world peace. So that's why all states should be interested in this. And uh, please also think about the arguments which appear now that maybe we should uh, create the regional uh, court which will be established by willing states, which are willing, uh, 
uh, which are really in favor of the prosecution of um, uh, Russian um, uh, criminals. But let's imagine another story. If you think about this first resolution adopted in the United Nations General Assembly, um, Against this resolution, few states voted against. Eritrea, Syria, North Korea, um, Belarus, and of course, Russia. So let's imagine that now they create the tribunal to judge us. We do not want to have this kind of situation. What we want, we want to have the general agreement on the rules which were agreed from night, at least from 1945. And that's why we need to have the whole world watching this, what is happening with the justice in Ukraine, and the whole world engaged in the creation of the, um, of the proceedings against uh, criminals. Thank you, Patricia. You raised several very important questions, including one about the responsibility of societies or nations living in authoritarian and totalitarian states. Um, but before we, of course, discuss this question, I would like to, to, to pass the floor now to, uh, to Lauri. Hello. Um, I think dealing with these war crimes and possible other crimes, obviously the crime of aggression in Ukraine is important beyond Ukraine. It's important for, for the evolution of, of the international community and international law. Because when we think about this, this field of international criminal law, international criminal justice, it's really up until quite recently, it has developed quite ad hoc, as lawyers say. We had in the 1940s, Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, and in the 1990s, uh, um, uh, Yugoslavia and, and uh, Rwanda, special, special tribunals. And then in 98, uh, the Rome Statute was adopted, the International Criminal Court was created, but of course, there was always this tension that, but does it really bound great powers? because you know several leading world powers permanent five members of the un security council uh, i mean with the european exceptions they are not member to it and uh, and there was there has always been a little bit this sense with international criminal justice that it is not for the victors that it is for you know the the mid mid range uh, mid range powers and by the way the situation in general assembly is also partly because some uh, some countries outside the west outside europe of course they have a different kind of memory of what has happened over the last 25 years and then they start to talk now when we for example establish a special a tribunal for Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. So what about uh, something that happened, I don't know, 2003 or something? So these questions will be, uh, will inevitably be asked at the, at the General Assembly. I think that what we have currently, uh, the most perspective, two avenues are A, Ukraine as the state, as you have seen in the news, they have already, the first trial has already started. Uh, of, a, of a war crime. I think what is, uh, what is amazing here is the, also the technological development that they can basically, you know, eavesdropping and so on can, uh, can enable you to identify, you know, soldiers who did certain things to the extent that, that we did not know from, from, from conflicts in the, in the past. And, and already, already the first level of accountability is a kind of naming and shaming that is happening when, when the world will know that somebody had with, with his wife a conversation, a, a rape fantasy or something in military conflict. Even if he never leaves you know, Russia and Russia protects him, he's already ashamed in a way. And the other is, yes, this uh, international criminal court, which does have jurisdiction over crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine, and, and, and de facto it will not be able to to deal with, with the crime of, of aggression. So this t tension remains. We are currently um, starting to prosecute you know, soldiers who, who shot civilians, but, but the guys who ordered this, they, they are actually, they are facing de facto you know, impunity. And even, even some politicians are, are suggesting that we should offer them an, offer them an off ramp so that they would not be you know, too, um, to insult it, but, but they are in this sense the root of the evil because they started the aggressive, aggressive war. My final comment is about, about Russia, um, because I have been a student of Russia and international law for many years, and 
I know this is not an academic conference, but there's a in new interesting book by a scholar, Michael Riepl. It's The title is R Russian Contributions to International Humanitarian Law. And it sounds, sounds, you know, kind of positive, but the argument of the book really is that these contributions only happened in the history, perhaps during the Tsarist period uh, with Martens and people like that. But during, since the Soviet Union, actually, Russia's, Russia's attitude to international humanitarian law has been, to put it mildly, problematic. It is, it is that the idea that international humanitarian law is mostly for the others. So, for example, in the, in the conflict, in military conflict in Chechnya, many war crimes were committed, but within Russia, even if the European Court of Human Rights indicated otherwise, you know, and recommended to deal with these crimes, they were never prosecuted as war crimes. So Russia has avoided that. It's the way international humanitarian law has been taken to Russian criminal code is very minimalistic. It is, it is, it is in, insufficient, and most importantly, it's not used. So in that sense, uh, the test currently is also that, that, that uh, will uh, this call for impunity um, also apply to a great power that has historically kind of behaved as if it could not commit war crimes? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauri and Paul. Uh, tell us, uh, from your perspective of, of a person who is more involved in a practical policy, uh, what can practical. we do? Practical. <laughs> what can we do? Wonderful. No, uh, it all lies in the hands of the politicians, so let's talk about the politicians. Um, and just a very brief disclaimer. Uh, I do work for the U.S. government, but these are not the views of the U.S. government. These are my personal views. So no citing it as the U.S. government. Um, so, politicians are just taken with this idea, I think all across the world, certainly in the United States, of taking oligarch money, the, the sort of blood money of the Russian state that's been hidden in our system, and providing it to victims of Russian war crimes. Um, and I, this makes perfect sense. I mean, there's an innate sense of justice to this, given that the oligarchs uh, are Putin's appendages in the West. Uh, they were the ones inside our system undermining it from within. They're a very important part of Putin's kleptocratic state, uh, and so on and so forth. And I guess, you know, this is not the time or the place to get into why there is a trillion dollars in blood money hidden in the West. I think that's a really important question itself, but uh, we'll avoid that for now, and we'll just go straight to the question of uh, really two questions that we're trying to answer, and I think everyone's kind of got on their minds. And that's one, how do we take the money under the rule of law? It's a very hard thing to do. I mean, our entire systems are based on property rights. So, I mean, we know sanctions, we know to freeze money, but how do we actually take the money? And the second is, how do we get it to Ukraine? Because actually, again, under international law, all money recovered would go back to Russia, because it's been stolen from Russia. So the international law requirements under the UN Convention Against Corruption is that the money be returned to Russia. And of course, this has been a huge problem with all sorts of other asset recovery procedures because the money just sat in asset recovery funds for ages because you can't give it back to the people who stole it. So we're facing actually a lot of different problems in getting this money back. Even though it's a priority, even though the G7 wants to do it, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to do. So this is the question of how do we turn sanctions into forfeiture? And there are a number of different ways to forfeit uh, proceeds of corruption in the, in the, in the U.S. system. Um, and this is what the Department of Justice is right now thinking about. So we now have this new task force klepto capture that's going around and trying to recover these funds. And it's working uh, with multilateral partners and this excellent name, which I love, this Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs, the repo task force. Um, you know, cross-border task force to work on getting this stuff. And we've seen some of the results. We've seen the seizures of these yachts all over Europe. We've seen the seizures of certain properties. Uh, note, these are seizures and not forfeiture. So once again, I know of no case so far where the money has actually been forfeited to any state. These are, these are, there's freezing, there's seizing, and there's forfeiture. So these are all separate things. Um, and the actual process of forfeiture takes years and years and years and years. Um, you know, we don't talk a lot about the Ukrainian oligarchs these days, I think for good reason, but they're kind of bad dudes too. Um, and have hidden a lot of money around the world uh, in a asset forfeiture action against Igor Kolomoisky's properties in the United States has been going on for years. So, I mean, when we think about like, okay, what are we doing here? How do we get this done quickly in the context of this war? How do we take this money? 
I mean, we just don't have a model for this. So we've been trying to develop something like this within the, um, within the hollowed halls of Congress. Um, one particular uh, proposal uh, actually has passed the House now, but before it, was, before it passed, it was, uh, it was basically turned into a messaging bill because the idea of this bill would have been to amend our sanctioning statute to allow sort of emergency confiscation of property above $5 million for sanctioned Russians whose money derives from corruption related to the Putin regime. And this ended up falling afoul of groups in the United States, who, like the American Civil Liberties Union, who protect Fifth Amendment, that is due process, uh, due process of law, um, rights. So this, this ended up being, you know, basically turned into, turn into a resolution, a non-operative resolution. It's still good that we passed it, but, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't have the power it did. Another option that we've been looking at is a Ukrainian Victims Fund. Now, we have this for U.S. victims of state-sponsored terrorism, where these funds that are recovered would go into a fund that can then be sued for damages by those that have been harmed in Ukraine. So they come and they actually, uh, you know, try to get money out of this fund which had belonged to Ukrainian oligarchs. And that answers both these questions, you know. Um, a third that we've now seen from the White House, uh, the White House has pushed down a number of different proposals on what it intends to do to get this money back. And they, again, this is in coordination with the G7. Um, and we've seen a few of these proposals, and they're, I mean, they're very good proposals, including uh, amendments to the racketeering statutes and, and all sorts of other stuff that would make sanctions evasion harder. A lot of it goes around, if the crime is sanctions evasion, then we have a criminal basis for taking the money, which is, I mean, it's very hard with money laundering or anything like that, because a lot of these crimes were committed um, 20 years ago, have been laundered through all sorts of shell companies and so on and so forth. So following it's very hard, but sanctions evasion is a little easier. Um, another proposal there was to actually criminalize possession of Russian money, which would be extraordinary. I mean, I mean that now that's like really thinking outside the box. You, I mean, if if that would make it that would make it illegal, uh, what even the lawyers that work for these guys do, and so on and so forth. You, and not only could you then recover the money, you could put them in jail, which would be which would be really great. That's justice, you know. That's really justice. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention this notion of, you know, we've one of the great sanctions achievements. Uh, of sort of the transatlantic alliance throughout this that came out of nowhere was freezing the reserves of the Russian Central Bank. Uh, that, I mean, there was a whole issue, oh my God, they've got all these, this, this war chest, they're gonna be able to fight sanctions for so long. Not if we just freeze all their reserves. So, so we did, and now we've got 100 billion, at least 100 billion, of frozen Russian reserves that are state property. These are not protected by uh, due process. State property is not private property. So can we take that and give it to victims of war crimes? So we're thinking about all these things. Um, I mean, one final note is that the global financial system remains extremely opaque. I mean, it's, it, we still face big challenges. We still face enablers working for Russia, even at this stage, you know? So it's still going to be an uphill battle. Thank you. Your, uh, you complimented very in interesting, um, in a very interesting way, uh, remarks of international lawyers. And um, I have perhaps after this discussion one small, uh, but I think uh, important question. Namely, uh, you uh, refer to justice. People want justice, especially people of Ukraine want justice, mm, even symbolic justice. I'm a historian, and uh, I remember that in December 1939. The Soviet Union was excluded from the League of Nations, from the uh, organization uh, which corresponds now to the um, organization of Organization of uh, uh, United Nations. It, uh, so the Soviet Union was excluded because of the attack against Finland. I remember that the head of the last head of the German state, Admiral Dönitz, was sentenced for uh, ten years because of his war crimes and the. Uh, German foreign minister, Mr. Ribbentrop, was not only sentenced, but also was hanged uh, because of his involvement in the war crimes. So perhaps, we, uh, would it be imaginable that we recognize um, Lukashenko, Putin, and, and the cronies as uh, enemies of, of mankind, and perhaps uh, simply uh, in a symbolic way, uh, we could bring now justice? Who would like to answer? Perhaps all of, of you. I mean, to some extent, one answer is in your question, because, because what preceded Nuremberg, for example, was the unconditional surrender of Germany. The Allied, in a way, they could, 
they could do whatever they wanted, and this is currently not the case. I mean, uh, already since the fall of communism, there have been also tribunals set up by private actors. We could, we could, you know, right now in this hall, you know, say that we do, we make a trial on something. The question is, what what would be the value of this if we if we proceed from the assumption that international community is a community of states and, and some sort of international basic rules of law uh, apply, then we should of course try to somehow um, follow these. But, but you know, I mean, it, is, it has not been tried out, but, but it is possible that other states would say that we are not accepting aggression anymore and that other states, indeed, even if it's a fraction of the international community, and for example, in a general assembly vote, it wouldn't be all states who would vote in, uh, for it, probably, so it would still be a fraction, you know. It could be done, it just hasn't been tried out yet, and it will take convincing. Dagmar? Yeah, maybe I can add that uh, international law is a very uh, specific type of law. Uh, it is always developing, uh, developed by the states, and it is it can move on. And uh, the states have the opportunity to uh, to act in this regard. Um, I mentioned a um, resolution by the United Nations General Assembly um, to recommend establishment of a sp uh, special tribunal, for example. Uh, this is not absolutely necessary, and it is not a, a question of legitimacy, but of later acceptance. If uh, an overwhelming majority of states would uh, decide that this should be punishable and uh, that such a court should be, a tribunal should be accepted, then according to uh, the rules uh, of international law, this is, uh, this is not uh, enough to establish a new rule, um, but um, state practice together with the conviction that this uh, should be a new law uh, can create new law. And uh, of course, uh, states can act again as they did uh, in the context of the Second World War. Um, and you can ask the question, this is maybe an, inter uh, an interesting international law question, uh, can Russia say, well, um, we are sort of a persistent objector to such a new rule. Normally, you can persistently object to new rules of customary international law. Um, but if uh, the community of states find that this should be a peremptory norm of international law, uh, because it is about the very fundaments of international law, uh, then uh, persistent the, the rule of persistent objection does not apply. That would be my suggestion. Okay, thank so, you. So, I, yeah, I might, I might just say, look, P Putin is a gangster and his regime is a criminal regime, and, and our problem has really been one of impunity for, since at least 2008, invasion of Georgia, probably since the 2007 Munich speech, probably even earlier than that. I mean, he has flouted every tenet of international law over and over and over again. We have yet still invited him to be part of all of our systems. They've remained in our systems. He's still part of Interpol. <laughs> right now, Russia is still part of Interpol. It's still part of the Financial Action Task Force. R R Russia has received great marks on its anti-money laundering regime. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I mean, there's just there's so much insanity here. You know, I, I, the, what needs to start happening is we need to start holding anybody in this regime to account under any laws that we can, whether they be national laws, whether they be you know, international laws, whether they be kicking these guys out of the international organizations, whatever, we still haven't done nearly enough on that. Um, but I mean, that's the thing is, that, you know, I, I don't want to build him up to be more than he is. You know, I mean, he, of course, you know, Putin is a monster and he's, he's, you know, Russia is a monstrous state. But I mean, at the end of the day, the mentality here is one of a gangster. This is about breaking the law and flouting the law and seeing what you can get away with. And so far, he's gotten away with everything over and over and over again. And that's how this war happened. Patricia, there's a term, uh, civilized nation. I, I, Paul said that Putin is a monster and Russia's monster. So what is your uh, view? Well, 
in my opinion, what we can agree now that if we observe so many crimes, war crimes, and uh, all states in the world are um, state parties to the Geneva Conventions on the Protection of War Victims, which oblige all states in the world mm -hmm. to prosecute criminals. And if you are superior, if you, uh, if you have this superior responsibility, command responsibility, and this responsibility Putin has, but instead of prosecution of the crimes, he's awarding battalions who were, for example, in Bucha, it's for sure that we, we can talk about his criminal responsibility. What does it mean? I do not expect from the ICC that ICC would issue arrest warrant against uh, Putin. Why? Because ICC needs to care about its credibility. And the case of Bashir, who was... Uh, um, 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 uh, who was searched for many? Uh, for uh, I'm talking about President of Sudan, who was, um, who was, uh, you know, you had arrest warrant which could not be executed for many years. This really undermined the credibility of the ICC. So ICC doesn't want to prosecute heads of the states anymore because the case of Kenyatta, uh, case of the uh, President of uh, Sudan, learned them the hard lesson that it's very really hard to prosecute head of the state. But I would like to stress one thing. Let's not focus only on Putin, because uh, there are many other people who are responsible for the crimes committed in Ukraine. And what is even more important, many of them, they have committed crimes before in Syria, in Chechnya, but we allowed for non-prosecution and now we are paying additional costs. So maybe this is now the time to stress that those people should be prosecuted not only for the crimes committed in Ukraine, but let's check, let's screen them and let's check why they were also bombarding hospitals in, in Syria and why they do the same in Ukraine. So I, I'm just stressing that we cannot just talk about this selective justice, but let's, let's just now have this new power to say let's come back to those principles on which we agreed after the second world war and let's apply them to everyone i don't know if you also saw this uh, short video with george bush jr who made this mistake and talk about this in, uh, horrible crime against Iraq. Oh, no, <laughs> Ukraine, yeah. But even he knows that there was a problem. But I would, of course, I would also not compare 2003 to 2022 because to proportion Gerde. But this also shows that we have this need of justice, not only for Ukraine, but also for previous crimes committed by Russian mm -hmm. criminals. Excellent point. And now there is the moment you can ask the question. I would like to open the floor and who would like to raise hands? Shimon Zaremba, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, my question refers to the possibility of any compensation for the victims, because we have already been talking a lot about you know, the accountability, uh, the need for justice, but it is also, well, in the end, uh, well, victims can be to some extent co compensated with money. I know, you know money cannot bring life, cannot bring health, etc. but still this is something which can, let's say, ease the pain for the people who were victims. So this is my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Rafał. Uh, Rafał Tarnogórski, uh, Polish Institute of International Affairs. The Russian aggression is uh, seen as a turning point of our time. Uh, at least at the, uh, politi po politically. But I wanted to uh, know, do you think that this is also a critical point for our international law as we know it? And I put it, Mark, uh, here because I wanted to answer uh, this question, but it's your uh, task. Thank you. Okay, and the third question. Elżbieta Kaca. I, I have a question to Paul Massaro because you've been talking lots uh, about uh, United States uh, options to freeze, uh, to confiscate Russian uh, assets. But could you tell us more what are the possibilities, options to confiscate uh, uh, frozen assets of Russian central bank in the EU? Because the biggest part uh, of the money 
uh, is in France, uh, Germany, and Austria. And to be honest, uh, you know, there is a scarce data uh, how much indeed they froze the assets of central Russian banks. And for instance, in case of France, there is a strict national le legislation restricting, uh, you know, uh, confiscating uh, such state money of uh, central banks. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, what is a political willingness in those states to confiscate money and uh, use it for reconstruction of Ukraine or, you know, compensate uh, the losses? Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Okay. If not, then uh, perhaps... Uh, the time allows also to answer one additional question of me. What is actually the legal responsibility of Lukashenko and Belarus for um, mm, providing uh, its territory uh, uh, to Russia and to aggression? And uh, you have six minutes to answer each of you, and then we'll be uh, exactly on time. Um, perhaps Patricia, Dag Dagmar, Paul, Lauri. Well. Uh, when you talk about compensation for the victims, uh, for example, in the ICC you have these kind of uh, measures because you have a trust fund for victims, so th there is a such possibility introduced in the permanent International Criminal Court. But I think that if you want to talk about compensation for justice, we need to focus more on state responsibility. And this state responsibility can be executed now in European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, where still you can have interstate uh, claims uh, concerning the uh, current armed conflict. But also we have the proceeding in International Court of Justice. So, for example, if states are persuaded that uh, um, we sh there should be some compensation for the victims for the crimes uh, um, committed by one or the other side, uh, then uh, why they should uh, maybe this is the time to also intervene in this proceeding and uh, support Ukrainian claims and also to make the legal argument concerning uh, exactly compensation for victims to exactly execute uh, the full reparations. And of course, I'm mentioning these proceedings because it is not easy to go to the ICJ. ICJ doesn't have compulsory jurisdiction. But, uh, and this is partially the answer to Rafał Tarnogórski uh, question. You are saying that maybe this is the turning point for the international law. Always this kind of events requires from us the thinking out of the box. Nobody was thinking previously to go to the ICJ to, to ask ICJ, check whether the uh, genocide was not committed, because this was the argument of Russia to start the war. So um, I think that now we need to think about this. We were focusing so much about the immunity of the state and protection of its property so far. But now lawyers are focusing, oh, come on, but what we discussed, we have the immunity from the um, uh, execution, immunity from the criminal jurisdiction, but nobody was talking about immunity from the administrative sanctions. So let's go to the United Nations and ask General Assembly to impose some sanctions, including uh, reparations, including the uh, freezing of the assets and spending them on the victims. This can be done by the United Nations and based on those decisions, other states, according to their rule of law, can use the assets which are available um, 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 in their country. And of course, we also remember that we talk, when we talk about responsibility, it's not only responsibility of Russia, it's not only responsibility of Belarus, which allowed to use its territory to commit aggression. And of course, from this perspective, Lukashenko can be uh, prosecuted for the crime of aggression, but still he's head of the state and we have many problems with this. But there is a state responsibility, and not only of Belarus and Russia. We also should open the discussion about the responsibility of those states which aid, which assist in the um, maintaining this aggression. Yeah? And this is quite important, because in international law we stress so much. There is, there is prohibition of genocide, prohibition of aggression, prohibition of crimes against humanity, and certain prohibition of certain war crimes. They are considered as peremptory norms. And as peremptory norms, the whole world needs to react, and nobody can accept the situation. So let's now check whether all states comply with this obligation related with the uh, peremptory um, norms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, almost all questions are answered. 
but maybe I can add <laughs> a little bit. Um, uh, concerning uh, your question, um, is there a critical point for uh, international um, law? Um, I think we should also consider the time factor. Uh, we are very pessimistic now. We find it uh, to be totally unrealistic to uh, bring uh, Mr. Putin and others to justice at the moment, but things can change over time. And uh, this is a time where um, investigations and um, uh, saving uh, evidence uh, is on the agenda. And uh, at this point, uh, something can be done and even be improved. Um, for example, the, um, um, the ICC prosecutor, for the first time ever, have, uh, has joined uh, a so-called uh, joint investigation team uh, under the auspices of uh, Euro, Euro ju just, you say in English, I think. Um, and um, this um, um, uh, instrument uh, can be broadened. Yeah? You can establish lots of JITs with other states uh, in order to save evidence. This is quite important. Um, maybe another interesting aspect is, if I may add this, this um, that Ukraine hasn't ratified the Rome Statute. And it's an interesting question that why haven't they done so? They uh, amended their, uh, their constitution to do so in 2019, but until now didn't rat ratify. And uh, if, you, if you read uh, the, the recognition, the ad hoc recognition um, uh, by the Ukrainian parliament uh, to accept uh, ICC jurisprudence, um, then uh, the uh, parliament um, accepts the jurisdiction of the court for the purpose of identifying, prosecuting, and judging the perpetrators uh, and accomplices of acts committed um, in the, t no, I'm, I'm sorry, committed by senior officials of the Russian Federation and leaders of terrorist organizations, DNR and LNR. Uh, and later, the Ukrainian foreign ministers tries to formulate this in a more neutral way to get away from the Russian officials, um, but uh, to, uh, uh, to refer to acts committed in the territory of Ukraine. And so maybe there is, a, uh, there is an interesting point or discrepancy uh, between uh, the Ukrainian parliament uh, and the government and of course the ICC. The ICC is not happy with prosecuting um, uh, certain nationals, but all persons committing crimes on a specific territory because the law must be applied equally. So the politics requires uh, continuity and consequency. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, great. So on the question of compensation, I thought it was a wonderful answer. I, I, just, I just reiterate that we're thinking a lot about that from the perspective of can we take oligarch assets and get them to war crimes victims. Mm -hmm. um, on the question of getting central bank assets. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge question. It's never been done before. I mean, the, the, the legal ramifications of it, I mean, it would require new legislation in the United States. It would probably require new legislation in the EU context. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nutty one because presumably it would be EU level. So you'd really have kind of a, it could be something that Brussels could really do. I mean, it, even when this whole crisis, when, this, when, this, when Putin invaded Ukraine, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, it, it was it was really thrilling almost to see the EU kind of suddenly become a major geopolitical force, you know, um, and that was that was exciting. Um, in this case, I mean, we're really talking about the European Central Banks. So I mean, you'd be like the the eurozone people. These are assets held in euros, you know. So uh, maybe not even the whole EU. Um, so uh, the the ramifications of that for like international finance would be massive because obviously a ton of states, most notably one giant one called China, holds more reserves than anybody else. And if we started seizing reserves, you know, then the China is like, oh my goodness, can they seize our reserves too? 
the 1.3 trillion we hold in dollars, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's and, I, and I hope the answer to that is yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this, is, this is our kind of, you know, asymmetric force. I mean, the Western world is the financial superpower of the globe. Everybody, all autocracy relies on access to our financial system, you know, to keep it going. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's an exciting question. I mean, it's, it's, it, it could be a whole panel. Um, on Belarus, yes. We try to always say Russia and Belarus. Um, and then I guess finally on the turning point of international law, um, you know, I'm not like these distinguished professor lawyers and it's not necessarily something you say on a panel of distinguished professor lawyers. I mean, I find myself somewhat skeptical of the state of international law given that we've integrated ourselves with a large number of non-rule of law states that regularly flout international law like it's going out of style. Um, I, I mean, I think that we could find ourselves as a much more robust and sustainable international law if we decoupled somewhat from some of these states. And I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, I certainly see that's what, think what, that's what we're seeing with Russia. I think a lot of, of what's happened with Russia is going to be years and years and years of Russian isolation. Uh, I think the much bigger question is China, which has invested very, very heavily in the manipulation and destruction of international law from within, um, within the UN context and within a lot of different contexts, um, and I think has done a lot more damage to international law than anyone else. Um, but it's going to be, I mean, I don't know, can we, can we move away from that? I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I, I always think like, you know, with the, the, obviously the, the USSR, did not comply with international law at all, but we weren't integrated with the USSR. You know, we're, we're, we're very deeply integrated with, with China, so I, I don't know. It's, it's a great question. Perhaps we'll have a chance to answer this question uh, in the next round. Uh, Laudi. Yes, so the question of this, uh, what it means for, for international law and its, its future. I think it's obvious that it is kind of a a breaking of a taboo because in, since 1945 this rule that we don't uh, threaten or use force against other countries in a way was the most important rule of international law. Yes, it has been violated before. Um, the difference with, um, for example, Kosovo and, and Iraq is that in the case of Iraq 2003 there was this uh, uh, question of whether previous resolutions of the United Nations Security Council from 1990 that were not implemented, whether they were still still applicable. At least there was a debate about that. And in, in the case of Kosovo, of course, it was what is the impact of human rights violations, this old debate on humanitarian intervention. Does it constitute an exception um, to, to the strict uh, prohibition of the use of force? What is disturbing about this war is that those pretexts or reasons that were given aside, it seems to be a classical kind of 19th century war for territory. Uh, when the constitutional amendments of 2020 in Russia were prepared, then Putin gave a TV interview in which he said, uh, he developed a theme that some republics left the Soviet Union not with what they came, so they, they got things from Russia, they got territory from Russia. So we are now seeing in this war how this initial rhetoric of, I don't know, genocide and so on is, is completely falling apart. It's not even taken too seriously by the party apparently who started uh, this rhetoric and we see attempts to already establish Russian rule in Kherson and, and, and so on and so forth. It, I think, International lawyers have to also be realist in the sense that we cannot pretend that it's not a problem for, for the, let's say, prohibition of the use of, 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 of force. And um, what Paul, Paul Massaro said, I think one um, possible development is some sort of further regional fragmentation of international law. If, if, if it, the idea of the universal international law of the UN Charter of 1945 is weakened and some regional powers claim basically that international law in that form does not apply in our backyard, 
like in Ukraine, we determine what the just border is, then, then in a way, nations like that will try to create themselves some sort of pockets where the universal rule doesn't apply. By the way, about the world order, think about the fact that the United Nations Charter still talks about the Soviet Union. Nobody has changed the, uh, it's so, so hard to change, so it says that the Soviet Union is one of the permanent members of the, of the Security Council, so the ghost of this country still pretty much uh, continues to live with us, and I suspect it also very much lives in, you know, Putin's and Lavrov's heads. Can I, can I just add to that? Because I think that I love that point, and it implies that Ukraine could be the successor to the Soviet Union and not Russia. So put Ukraine on the UN Security Council. <laughs> Ukraine does not want to be a successor of the Soviet Union, but it, uh, Ukraine recognized itself rather as a state occupied by the Soviet Union, at least a nation. But uh, excellent discussion. We have still 10 minutes, and it's because of the great time discipline of our panelists. So I have two additional questions I would like now to ask, and one brief remark uh, uh, on my side, namely what you just said. Uh, Paul and, uh, and Lauri remind me of the Soviet uh, textbooks, um, handbook about the international law from 1950s, so I read once. And it, uh, the st uh, handbook stated that the, they, were, they are uh, bourgeois norms of international law and progressive norms of international law. And the Soviet Union is obliged to observe only progressive norms. And, and questions from uh, the online audience. I will read. What is the role for the EU in seeking accountability for international crimes committed in Ukraine? What could the EU do to improve the documentation or prosecution of these crimes? So first question, the role of the EU. And second, can a Russian Minister of Defense and Chief of Staff, Gerasimov, be prosecuted and arrested. Uh, ten, uh, two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Uh, Paul, uh, Lauri, uh, Patricia, and Dagmar. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, I'll let others go on the kind of evidence collection and that sort of thing. And I'll just say, I mean, the, you know, the EU is absolutely has a giant role to play. It's you know been absolutely critical to the G7 plus one structure that's you know kind of led this and the coordination of the sanctions as well as. The, the counter war crimes effort. Um, and I mean, again, there's a lot of Russian money <laughs> in the EU. Um, so I'm hopeful, and, and there's a lot of enablers of Russia in the EU too. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that Russian money will be seized and those enablers of Russia will be brought to justice. As for Gerasimov uh, and Shoigu, like definitely. Okay, uh, Lauri. Yeah, well, the EU ga can kind of show us the direction and it can give us, I mean, ideologically or rhetorically, the EU can say, the leaders of the EU can say what they consider is right and, and I think this, this will be heard. They can also give funds, but the EU is not a state. So it's also a little bit uh, the question between uh, what the EU does and the, what the member member states does is kind of criminal prosecution. You know, for example, it would be done by courts. And, um, you know, I, I think at the moment I cannot imagine how, how they would end up in EU courts. I also want to say, in that sense, I remain a scholar for the balance sake that we should also follow what the Russians are doing, because I think now, for example, that they got hold of, of, uh, of the soldiers of uh, Azovstal and so on, I'm, I'm sure they are, they are already also preparing for their own quote-unquote war crimes trials. In, uh, I, I read in Russian media they want to do things in, in uh, Donbas. Uh, you know, we will, we at least we have to follow follow these. This is also part of the reality, whatever is you know behind behind there. But other than that, and this this, this is a general <coughs> problem with with doing things far away. I mean, at Nuremberg, with one exception, who was in uh, in absentia, and Hitler was of course dead by that time, uh, you know, these folks were at the custody of the Allies. Mr. Gerasimov is not at the custody of, of anyone else. He's, he's uh, continuing the war effort from Russia. Uh, Patricia? Well, starting from the question concerning the responsibility of Minister of uh, Defense, 
of course he is responsible because uh, even if I refer to the uh, recent judgment in case of Bemba, this was, uh, he was accused for the crimes committed in Central African Republic. In the, in the appeals chamber, he was found not guilty, but what is interesting in this judgment, the, uh, the court uh, pointed out that what counts is whether you are able to do something, whether you can take certain measures. Definitely Mr. Of, uh, Minister of Defense can do it, has uh, more even tools than, for example, the commander in the field. And his job is to supervise uh, what the troops are doing in the field. So, of course, I, uh, I would uh, indicate Minister of Defense as a, one of the first accused in the uh, international uh, trial. Concerning European Union, I would like to point on one thing. We cannot forget, because it's not just, you know, of winning hearts and minds here in Europe. It's about winning hearts and minds of the whole world. And we cannot ignore the fact that Russia was stressing the pressure not only from NATO, but also from the European Union. The whole critics of the um, involvement of the Western states in the Orange Revolution, uh, the, uh, the critics of the direction of Ukraine towards European Union. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, um, establishment of the tri tribunal or any kind of procedures by Ukraine together with European Union, because this would confirm the Russia ac accusation. But still, European Union, these are states, and those states, they have obligations according to the international law. So they could make joint statements, they could uh, um, coordinate together actions concerning collection of evidence. Because even if, even if today there, it is very difficult to prosecute Shoigu, prosecute uh, Putin, but Maybe they would love to visit the uh, Baltic uh, Sea um, in Poland someday, and then uh, w prosecutor could start a case uh, against them, even if the whole world would seem to forget about those crimes. Okay, uh, Dagmar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Coming back to your question on the EU, um, I already mentioned, I've already mentioned uh, Eurojust, um, which can provide some um, mechanisms um, in order to investigate crimes. And uh, of course, the EU can uh, uh, contribute financial means. And the, uh, uh, the, pr uh, the prosecutor of the ICC um, has a Approached the community of states to uh, 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 to give some financial aid. Um, uh, coming back to the uh, the question of uh, the minister, the Russian minister uh, of defense, um, just. Just one more um, aspect. Um, this is, uh, of course, um, there must be always knowledge in order to establish individual responsibility. Um, but there is a nice saying of uh, deliberate ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you can be guilty of deliberate ignorance, or more than that in this case. And uh, this is enough to establish uh, criminal uh, accountability. Thank you very much. Excellent point about uh, deliberate ignorance. So, um, I have to say that this was for me ex uh, extremely important, very interesting discussion. I I learned a lot. Uh, there are lots of things w uh, which I absolutely agree. There's perhaps one thing when I slightly disagree with the statement that uh, the Russian people, the Russian nation, are not uh, uh, sh their responsibility should be uh, somehow diminished or. Um, excluded from the uh, responsibility of Putin, uh, Shoigu, and uh, all other members of Kremlin elites. Namely, I consider that the, all those Russians who who shouted, uh, the Crimea is ours, who allowed um, foreign policy actions violating international law in recent years, and now, and the, and, and now they are silent, they take at least moral a responsibility for the action of the states, and so it's more or less 80% of, of, of Russians. Sad, but true. But uh, having said that, I would like to thank you very cordially. Uh, you, are, you were excellent speakers. Thank you also uh, uh, that you uh, listened, you asked the questions, and I would like to announce, uh, or not, <laughs> I would like not to announce, since we have uh, another pa pa panel just right after this, this one. Thank you.